It's no secret that creationist preacher Kent Hovind and I have our differences when it comes to the theory of evolution. He says animals can be neatly divided into kinds, defined as those that can bring forth. See, if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Simple definition, can they bring forth? Which means that no matter how many generations pass, they never change into new kinds, in other words, animals that can't interbreed. I cite the evidence showing that animals do change over time to the point where they can no longer interbreed, thus forming new species. It's a process called speciation, and it's the very definition of evolution. Hovind and I are so far apart on this that I'm sorry to say we're no longer speaking to each other, and I've stopped making prison visits. But now I've got some important and exciting news. It seems that we're about to reconcile our beliefs. I know, hard to fathom, but in the interests of love and harmony, we may have come up with a mingling of our cerebral juices, if you will, that satisfies us both. I'm talking about nothing less than a coming together of evolution and creationism. Love, exciting and new, come aboard. We're expecting you and love, life's sweetest reward. Not like that. When I talk about reconciling evolution and creationism, I don't mean I've changed my position at all. No, Hovind has, and I didn't even notice it. So let me tell you how this extraordinary revelation came about. Last year I did a video on ring species in which I quoted Hovind giving a very clear definition of a kind. If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Simple definition, can they bring forth? A dog and a wolf can mate and bring forth. A dog and a banana cannot. Now see, Charlie Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species, and how the Christian church got lost in the 1800s and didn't catch that, I don't know, but they didn't catch what's happening. They're changing the definition. If they'd have stuck with the word kind, we never would have had this dumb evolution theory permeating our society. They bring forth, they're the same kind. Anyway. Couldn't be simpler. And then, of course, I showed how ring species completely stuff up this neat definition. Same kind, same kind, same kind. Dope! Oh! We've hit the same problem. These ones at the end can't be the same kind because they can't interbreed. Not long afterwards, I got a message from a Hovind fan, Shift Plus 180, who said I had misrepresented Hovind's definition of a kind. He said Hovind accepts that animals change over time because of natural selection. Yes, that's true, he always has said that. Hovind calls this microevolution. But the fan went further, insisting that Hovind also accepts that this change can produce descendants that can't interbreed. I told him Hovind can't possibly have admitted that. I mean, that's the very definition of evolution. But blow me down, he was right. He sent me a clip of Hovind debating students at Berkeley. The Bible says if they can bring forth, that is, reproduce, they're the same kind. It could be that animals have diversified, like Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits, can no longer interbreed. Okay, but they're still obviously the same kind. They could originally interbreed. I hope you understand what Hovind is saying here. If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. This is his simple definition as he's explained it before. But then he goes on to say that even if they can't bring forth, they can also be the same kind as long as they have a common ancestor. I thought Hovind must have been cornered by radical Berkeley biologists, but when another YouTuber, YouTube Detective, sent me a video he had made criticizing my ring species video, he included yet another Hovind clip, containing the same subtle shift in position. Natural selection will never change an animal to a new kind of animal. It'll only keep the species strong. And it might allow the species to adapt to a new environment. We now have Alaska rabbits that are able to survive in 20 below zero. And we have Florida rabbits that are able to survive in 100 degrees. And they are not interfertile. They're considered a different subspecies, maybe even a different species. I don't know. Now, both of those, Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits, can breed with Minnesota rabbits. They're kind of in the middle. Okay. And they're going to say, see, this is evolution. No, it's a variation, and it's still a rabbit. That doesn't prove we came from a rock, folks. 
That's just a variety. That's all it is. And that's all that can ever be offered is examples of variation. <laughs> Far from being a clip of Hovind I won't show you, I'm delighted to show you this because, once again, Hovind amends his definition of a kind. It's possible Hovind had to make this change when someone pointed out that Florida and Alaska rabbits can mate with Minnesota rabbits, but not with each other. It's a kind of ring species with open ends. But in making the change, Hovind has opened up a whole new can of worms. You see, if Hovind accepts that a population of rabbits can split into two groups that evolve, so, sorry, change over time, to the point where they can no longer interbreed, then he also has to accept that each of these populations can then split into two groups that change over time to the point where they can no longer interbreed, and so on, and so on. So what we end up with is this. A lot of groups, each looking very different from the others, some bigger, some with longer tails, longer snouts, different diets, that can no longer interbreed. Now, what does this chart remind you of? If this is not evolution, then what is it? It's a variation, and it's still a rabbit. But evolution is variation. So let's do a quick checklist of what the theory of evolution actually proposes and compare. Hovind thinks a species will change over time as it adapts to new environments, and that's what the theory of evolution says. Hovind thinks this is because of natural selection. Well, that's what the theory of evolution says. Hovind thinks this will produce a variety of new populations of animals that can no longer interbreed. Yes, that's what the theory of evolution says. Hovind calls this variation. The theory of evolution calls it evolution. And finally, Hovind says organisms change, but always stay within their own kind. And the theory of evolution can at last agree, since a kind is now defined as an organism that shares a common ancestry. So the only thing we're left arguing about is what to call this process, and since Hovind has come so far in accepting every single facet of the theory of evolution, as described by Charles Darwin, I think I can accommodate him a little by accepting whatever name he wants to call it. Because, quite frankly, what to call a discovery is far less important than the discovery itself. And I'm happy to call animals that share a common ancestor a kind, if Hovind wants to call them that, rather than genus, family, order and class, as preferred by biologists. So is there any last loophole that prevents variation from being exactly the same as evolution? Yes, Hovind has another way to define a kind, and that is, it's obvious. So obvious that the acid test for a kind is to get a five-year-old child to tell you. Now, this seems like such an absurd and unscientific definition, even for Hovind, that you probably think I'm making it up. So, roll tape. I think in 99.9% .9 of the cases, it would be obvious to a five-year-old which animals are the same kind. And just to show he's right, in another lecture, Hovind finds a five-year-old, well, a six-year-old, who can do just that. Is anybody in here five or six years old? Who's five or six? How old are you? Six. What's your name? Hmm? Rachel. Rachel? Rachel? Why don't you take a test here, Rachel? Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? The banana. Very good. Let's give her a hand. Now, this right. isn't my test for what defines a kind. It's Hovind's. So let's apply it. Which one is not like the others? clearly the banana, which makes all the others the same kind, right? They're all rabbits. Sorry, no, they're not. This one is a hare. But that's okay. Hares and rabbits share a common ancestor, and they're all laparids. And since Hovind defines a kind as a population that shares a common ancestor, even though they can't interbreed, and a five-year-old thinks a banana is the odd one out, then laparids are obviously the same kind. And while we're at it, varieties of pika also share a common ancestor with rabbits and hares, so they must be the same kind. Now, pika aren't laparids, but pika, rabbits and hares are all lagomorphs, so they're all the same kind. Now, pika don't exactly look like rabbits, but that doesn't matter. That's not a criterion for being the same kind. Hovind shows that himself in this illustration of what variation can do to an animal kind. And biologists agree. What an animal looks like is no guide to its genetic heritage. I'll show you what I mean. Here we have an echidna, a hedgehog, a porcupine, and a banana. 
Once again, the banana is not like the others, which a five-year-old can tell you must mean that the others are the same kind. But one's a rodent, one's an insectivore, and the others a monotreme, which means it lays eggs. Even so, they all fulfill Hovind's criteria for being the same kind. They're all mammals. Remember, I'm going by Hovind's definition of a kind, not mine. They share a common ancestry, even though they can't interbreed, and they're obviously the same kind when put up against a banana for the judgment of a five-year-old. What about the name? Maybe if they all have the same name, they're the same kind. Well, Hovind doesn't define a kind that way, and for good reason, because animals don't come with names, we give them names. If you want to argue that bears are the same kind because they're all called bears, what about koala bears? If they're really bears, then how come they have pouches and other bears don't? And there's another danger with grouping animals by their names. If you stick a five-year-old creationist kid in front of this puzzle, it's likely to cause some confusion, because obviously the banana is again not like the others, so they must all be the same kind. Yes, they're all apes. Oh dear, you may not like where this is heading. And if they're all the same kind, they must have a common ancestor. Quick, get that kid away and send him off to Christian camp. Oh, gosh, creationists are running out of get-out clauses here. OK, here's one. Animals can evolve, sorry, change over time into new varieties, but there's a limit on how far that evolution, sorry, that variation can go. OK, what's the limit? If one population of animals can divide into two, and each of those can divide into two, and each of those can divide into two, what's the limiting factor? Does natural selection suddenly stop working after a certain number of species have been produced? As long as they're all defined as the same kind, no creationist seems to have imposed any limit. After discovering Hovind's change of definition, I soon began to find other creationists accepting speciation, even in websites like Answers in Genesis. Barriers to reproduction do seem to arise among varieties that once interbred. But again, Gary Parker doesn't like to call this evolution. How does he get out of it? Well, he explains, any real evolution, macroevolution, requires an expansion of the gene pool, the addition of new genes and new traits. Well, that's not any definition of evolution I've ever heard of. And in fact, biology textbooks are full of examples of organisms that lose traits as they evolve. The ancestors of whales once had feet. The ancestors of penguins could fly. The ancestors of moles could see. And the ancestors of chickens had teeth. And at the same time, they gain new traits. Whales can hold their breath underwater, penguins are protected against the cold, moles have powerful claws for digging. All of this is evolution. Evolution is defined in most biology textbooks as a change in the gene pool, a change in features and traits, and a change or a modification of an organism's characteristics. Parker is trying to make up his own definition of evolution simply because the accepted definition is uncomfortably close to his view of how animals change over time. But the problem with trying to shift the goalposts like this is that his own new theory of speciation automatically moves with them, because whatever arguments he uses to show that animals can't change into new species automatically negates his own theory that animals can change into new species. Let's take Parker's main argument against evolution as an example. Each variety resulting from reproductive isolation has a smaller gene pool than the original. What he's saying quite correctly is that evolution works like this. A population of animals separates geographically into two groups. According to the theory of evolution, each will change over time. One group might move into a cold environment and grow thick fur and a mechanism for preventing frostbite. Another group might live in a wooded environment and adapt to climbing trees. A third group might adapt to tropical wetlands and change its diet to crabs and insects. Now, Parker argues that evolution isn't possible because as each population splits, each new subgroup will have a smaller gene pool than the original large group. Instead, he proposes a different model of speciation. A population of animals separates geographically into two groups. According to Parker's idea, each will change over time. One group might move into a cold environment and grow thick fur and a mechanism for preventing frostbite. Another group might live in a wooded environment and adapt to climbing trees. A third group might adapt to tropical wetlands and change Wait, its diet to crabs oh, and insects. On. This is exactly the same as the theory of evolution. 
But according to Parker, evolution can't happen because each separated population has a smaller gene pool. And yet, according to Parker, speciation can happen under exactly the same circumstances using exactly the same mechanism of natural selection. So, as long as we don't call it evolution, creationists accept that animals can evolve. Oh, damn, I mean, change. And Hovind agrees, as long as we call it variation. Because if we switch from a hypothetical to a real example, Hovind says that canids, or dogs as he calls them, all came from a common ancestor, producing wolves that can survive in Arctic conditions, foxes that can climb trees in North American forests, and foxes that live in South American swamplands eating crabs and insects. Since Parker argues that this kind of change or variation happens, we can't really take him seriously when he gives reasons as to why it can't happen. And here's someone else who accepts that it happens. Since two dogs walked off the ark, then as the population of dogs increased, eventually the population would split up and different groups would form. As the gene pool was split up, different combinations of genes inherited from the original dogs would end up in different groups. Thus different species would form, such as dingoes, wolves and so on. Now evolutionists have always insisted that such a process happens slowly, and therefore the Bible can't be right when it says the land animals came off the ark only four and a half thousand years ago. It's interesting that the only difference Ken Ham can find with evolution is the time scale. Now, I've always known that Ken Ham, like other creationists, accepted natural selection. The evolution of the horse is explained right there in his creation museum. Of course, it's not called evolution, it's called development. Boy, they really think it's all about what you call something, don't they? But the diagram doesn't show the horse evolving or developing into different species that can't interbreed. And for the most part, creationist preachers won't tell you this unless someone specifically brings up the issue of ring species or rabbits. So now you have two different ways to confuse a creationist. If they don't accept that animals change into new species that can't interbreed, show them the example of ring species. And if they do accept it, then ask them how this is different to evolution. But isn't it nice after all these years to know that creationists are finally accepting evolution or change or variety or whatever they want to call it. And it's so nice to come together. Love. Not like that. <laughs>